in the U.S. 32nd Infantry Red Arrow Division, an American infantryman from Grand Rapids, Michigan, asserted, If I owned New Guinea and I owned hell, I would live in hell and rent out New Guinea. The terrain, climate, and sickness devastated the regiments of the 32nd Division and the Australian battalions accompanying them. In addition to the suicidal and determined Japanese resistance of the northern Papuan coastline area of Buna, three times as many lives were lost in Papua during a comparable period of time as in Guadalcanal, when the magnitude of the attacking forces was taken into account. Malaria struck over two-thirds of the Allied forces assaulting the northern coast of Papua. Diseases' mortality outnumbered those of fighting by a factor of four or five. Time magazine initially introduced the American public to New Guinea at the end of December 1942, stating that American soldiers are engaged in fighting so desperate, so merciless, so bitter, or so bloody, nowhere in the world today, that a GI fighting on the Buna front should worry out loud, God help us, we're never going to get out of here alive, is understandable. Similarly, an infantryman in the Japanese army noted, The road gets gradually steeper. We are in a jungle area. Here, the sun is intense. There are no routes through the forest we navigate. There are no words to describe the jungle. Hollow in the stomach, thirsty for water. It's a heavy pack on the back. The men at the front were perhaps among the most wretched-looking soldiers ever to wear the American uniform. A veteran of the Buna described his fellow Americans. They had sunken eyes and were pale and haggard, with dark circles beneath them. There were tropical sores all over them. Almost every soldier who ventured into the bush, numbering in the thousands, suffered from a fever at least once. Immediately north of the Australian continent, New Guinea is the second biggest island in the world, spanning 1,500 kilometers. Australia was in charge of Papua, the southeast region of New Guinea that makes approximately one-third of the country's total area. It was seen by Australia's military strategists as a deterrent to Japanese invasion of the Northern Territories. The interior is hostile, to put it mildly. The terrain is dominated by the tall mountains of the Owen Stanley Range, and swamps and rainforests are prevalent. The majority of the 3,000 residents of the South Coast's principal settlement, Port Moresby, prior to the conflict were indigenous Papuans. Buna and Gona are two of the few communities found along the northern coast of Papua. Northeastern New Guinea's Ley and Salamawa are located on the northern coast close to the Hoon Gulf. The Buna area is composed of shoulder-high kunai grass fields, coconut plantations, and scorching, impenetrable jungle, despite the fact that the entire region is a low-lying plain. The Kokoda Trail was the sole indigenous route that connected the north and south beaches beyond Port Moresby. There would be enormous topographical and meteorological barriers to either side's ability to undertake military operations in terms of troop deployments, reinforcements, supplies, and wounded care. A huge conflict in the remote, disease-ridden, and perpetually wet South Pacific region caught Australia, the United States, and Japan off guard. In order for the fighters to progress in New Guinea, they would require the ability to build makeshift bridges and roadways in areas where mud and water controlled traffic. How did some of the most brutal fighting in the South Pacific take place at the Buna Front? Following its remarkable run of lightning victories following Pearl Harbor, the Japanese High Command considered launching Operation FS, a southeast expansion into the Solomon Islands, New Caledonia, the New Hebrides, Fiji, Tonga Islands, and Samoa by the Imperial Japanese Navy, IJAN, with the aim of cutting off the long supply lines that connected the United States to Australia and New Zealand. This would effectively prevent the antipodes from serving as American staging grounds or bases for a counteroffensive. The intention of the Imperial Japanese Army, IJA, was to invade the Hoon Gulf region of northeast New Guinea, specifically the La Salamaua area, with the aid of the IJN. After Lei and Salamaua were captured, 
to Laji, which is located in the Solomons close to Guadalcanal, would be occupied and developed into a naval air base. The goal of the IGN's seizure of Tulagi in the southern Solomons and these key locations in eastern New Guinea was to neutralize the waters north of Australia and cut off connection between these regions and the Australian mainland. The Japanese would eventually have to make up for this oversight as they left open the South Pacific supply lanes to Australia, New Zealand, and New Caledonia by delaying Operation FS the more comprehensive southeastern assault. Beginning on March 8-11, 1942, when the IGA and the IGN's Special Naval Landing Force, SNLF, landed at Salamalva, Ley, and Fishhaven in the Hoon Gulf, the Japanese initiated their staging moves to seize northeastern New Guinea and Papua. By operating out of Port Moresby, the Japanese were able to deny the Allies access to airfields in northern Australia, despite being only 400 air miles from Cape York, Australia's northernmost point directly facing Papua. By April 1942, Japanese air power and naval maneuvers in the Solomon Sea were severely damaged by Allied airstrikes, since neither side had fully established air superiority over New Guinea. The SNLF soldiers landed in Fifak, Babo, Sorong, Manakwari, Momi, Nabire, Saroy, Sarmi, and Hollandia along the north coast of northeast New Guinea from April 1 to April 20 was ultimately derailed at the Battle of the Coral Sea on May 4 to 8, 1942. In late summer 1942, plans were prepared to launch a second effort at the seaborne invasion of Port Moresby this time from Milne Bay on the eastern edge of Papua, where it just so happened that Australian and American engineers had started work on building an airfield. In order to capture Port Moresby, the Japanese planned to launch their Milne Bay assault simultaneously with an IJ overland assault from Buna via the Kokoda Trail and the Owen Stanley Range. The Japanese believed that a route that might be used for transportation connected Buna to Kokoda Village in the northern foothills of the Owen Stanley Range. However, the jungle canopy prevented the road from being seen and photographed clearly. The IGA engineers and laborers from Formosa and Korea could operate such a road and construct more southerly tracks to reach Port Moresby. But the IGA planners had made a poor logistical decision. President Franklin D. Roosevelt gave General Douglas MacArthur the order to depart the dangerous Corregidor Island for Mindanao and subsequently travel to Australia via cable on February 21, 1942, when he was in the Philippines. Four PT boats carrying MacArthur and his staff of officers departed Corregidor on March 11 and brought them to Mindanao. From there, they were transported to Australia. At the Australian government's express request, Army Chief of Staff General George C. Marshall nominated him Commander-in-Chief, Southwest Pacific Area, SWPA Theatre. General Sir Thomas Blamey was chosen by Australian Prime Minister John Curtin to lead the Allied land forces in the SWPA. Curtin was relieved to have the Green American 32nd and 41st Infantry Divisions, both National Guard units, hurriedly sent to defend Australia because his own AIF forces were either in captivity or the Mediterranean, the latter having fallen after Malaya and Singapore. In April 1942, the 41st Division reached Australia, followed by the 32nd Division in May. Following MacArthur's assumption of command of the SWPA by the U.S. Joint Chiefs of Staff, JCS, he was tasked with the vague goals of retaking Ley and Salamala, as well as seizing and occupying Rebol and adjacent positions in the New Guinea, New Ireland area. Buna Government Station, with its small airfield, the Old Strip, was the logical location for MacArthur's staff to establish an airfield in order to retake Ley and Salamala. Buna had been an Australian outpost facing Rebol on the Solomon Sea and consisted of a government station called Buna Mission, just three houses, and the Old Strip. Half a mile to the northwest sat Buna Village, nothing more than a jumble of aboriginal houses. 
an older mission was located at Gona, 10 miles north of Buna. In the southwest Pacific, Buna was desired by Allied and Japanese war strategists as a potential base and airfield complex. The potential of Buna as a location for an airfield had been investigated by MacArthur's engineers. The Allied engineers left after determining that the coastline terrain was suitable. MacArthur gave the Australian commander in Port Moresby instructions to safeguard the Buna area because it was expected to be a target for the Japanese as well. The Japanese seizure of Port Moresby, which the enemy could utilize as a launching pad for an invasion of northern Australia, was MacArthur's greatest dread. The Buna region was viewed as a serious danger by Australian military planners, as well since it was the northern terminus of the one good track to Port Moresby, or the Kokoda Trail, to take control of Buna. The Australians formed a native constabulary unit and a militia unit, the 39th Battalion, in June 1942. Eight days later, Company B of the Australian 39th Battalion was on the fringes of Kokoda Village. On July 7, Company strength elements of the Australian 39th Battalion were ready to begin their ascent of the Kokoda Trail, 30 miles north of Port Moresby. On July 24, orders were issued for the remaining members of the 39th Battalion to proceed from Port Moresby as soon as possible to Kokoda Village. That village was located in the northern slopes of the Owen Stanley Range, in a valley 1,200 feet above sea level. Apart from housing a rubber plantation and a Papuan government station, Kokoda Village also featured a small airstrip which was also a primary goal in Japanese strategic planning. MacArthur gave the order to create his advance base at Buna on July 15. Furthermore, plans called for building a new airstrip at Dobadura, which is located 15 miles south of Buna. There, a grassy plain large enough for bombers and fighters was found. The Buna Strip had not been suitable for the airbase that the SWP commander had in mind, according to reconnaissance aircraft conducted by the Allies. But at Buna and the adjacent Gona, the Japanese had outwitted the Allies. Japanese cruisers, destroyers, and transports under the command of Major Jin, Tamataro Hori landed a preliminary force of 4,400 engineers from the Yokoyama Advance Force, commanded by Colonel Yosu Yokoyama and the South Seas Detachment IJ headquarters, which had taken Raval, the IJ's 41st Infantry Regiment, led by Colonel Yazawa Kiyomi, and the remaining 144th Infantry Regiment would be added to this advance force, bringing the total number of men to 11,100. Lieutenant General Harukichi Hakutake, the commander of the IJ 17th Army, was based in Rabal, the Bunagona area would be taken over by the IJA by August 13 and converted from its previous location into a base of operations. Yokoyama moved quickly to deploy his forward units on their southerly march to Kokoda Village following the Japanese landings at Buna. This force attacked the Australians on July 28 in an attempt to take Kokoda Village and its valuable airstrip. It was made up of the 1st Battalion. 144th Infantry Regiment, which was the force's primary combat arm, and the 15th Independent Engineer Regiment, which would construct depots and clear roads. This force's initial assignment was to evaluate the state and quality of the roads, as well as the necessity of fixing the Buna to Kokoda Road. But, without conducting a comprehensive feasibility study, the Yokoyama force was ordered by no less than the Emperor and Imperial Japanese headquarters to get ready for an overland assault to capture Port Moresby, Operation M.O., led by IJA 17th Army headquarters. This was in place of conducting a civil engineering reconnaissance. General Hori was unconvinced that regardless of the real condition of the remaining road, a supply line of native porters 32,000 was considered a necessary quantity could be maintained. The Kokoda Trail was actually a 145-mile mud trail, 
no larger than three or four feet that passed some of the world's most hostile terrain including steep gorges swift moving streams and always damp moss-covered rocks and logs it even climbed mountains as high as six thousand feet meanwhile allied air engineer and anti-aircraft elements were strengthening port moresby with the arrival of the australian twenty fifth brigade the two surviving battalions of the one hundred and forty fourth infantry regiment and a mountain artillery battalion which was forced to land at basabo west of bumen yergona due to allied air interdiction and then be transported to bumen to support yokoyama's command at ishirava were also expected to be reinforcements for the yokoyama advance force on august twenty eight Haikutek gave Hori orders to move to the southern edge of the Owen Stanleys and wait for the conclusion of the IGN amphibious assault at Milne Bay, which was meant to take control of the recently built Allied airfield and act as a base for a second naval assault on Port Moresby. On August 25, the Japanese launched their amphibious landings at Milne Bay. However, they were unsuccessful, and on September 7, they withdrew their assault soldiers. Hori was on his own without air support from the IGN in the absence of a simultaneous amphibious attack on Port Moresby from Milne Bay. Hori's South Seas detachment was rapidly deteriorating due to acute malnourishment and widespread illness. General Hori, an IGA infantry from the 41st and 144th regiments, arrived in Kokoda Village early in September but they were in poor condition japanese soldiers along with laborers from korea and formosa had to transport supplies to the front wounded soldiers back to kokoda village hori's logistics were a problem and he was running late to attack port moresby by crossing the owen stanleys the australians had just withdrew to imita ridge across the valley to the south and on september sixteenth nineteen forty two the Japanese struggled up Arabewa Ridge. The Japanese were so happy to see the plains and sea around Port Moresby that they started crying. The Japanese were able to see the searchlights of the Allied airport located 27 air miles distant from Arabewa Ridge during the night. This was the closest the Japanese would ever go to Port Moresby. Nearly all of the army had been killed, wounded, or crippled by diseases such as malaria, dysentery, dengue fever, and beriberi, and the Japanese supply chain was at breaking point. The Japanese had been forced to retreat from Buna across the Owen Stanley Range, halted by the Australians and the harshness of Papua. After barely four weeks of arduous marching and jungle fighting, only 1,000 five hundred of the six thousand troops that had left buna in mid-august were fit enough to fight hori was forced to halt his drive on port moresby at Orabewa ridge and prepare defensive works while awaiting reinforcements due to a stiffened australian resistance at imita ridge by two australian militia battalions which was later reinforced with more battle-hardened Middle East veteran formations of the AIS 28th Brigade, as well as a near-constant Allied air presence that attacked Japanese supply lines running back to Buna. On September 24, though, Hori was given orders by the Japanese High Command to retreat via the Kokoda Trail and take up defensive positions at Buna and Gona. On September 28, Australian forces launched an attack on the Japanese positions along the Arabawa Ridge, where they had set up cannons, excavated weapon pits, and constructed trenches throughout the final week of September. The Japanese made this planned retreat in response to their growing need for soldier reinforcements at Guadalcanal. MacArthur sought a corps commander for the embryonic American Corps which consisted of the 32nd and 41st infantry divisions training in australia by chance marshall forwarded him lieutenant jen robert l eichelberger a 1909 graduate of west point the divisions 32nd and 41st under the leadership of major jens they were also sent edwin harding and horace fuller respectively before the Japanese high command stopped Hori's advance on the Oorabewa Ridge on September 10, 
MacArthur gave the order for Eichelberger's I Corps headquarters to send Harding's 32nd Division to New Guinea in order to relieve the pressure on the Australians retiring along the Kokoda Trail to the Emita Ridge. MacArthur sent the 126th and 128th regiments of the comparatively inexperienced 32nd Division to Port Moresby without providing them with any significant training in jungle combat. Furthermore, the 32nd Division was not given the same training that other Army Ground Forces divisions that were receiving domestically because it was a National Guard unit that was sent to Australia ahead of schedule. By September 28, the day General Horry's troops left their positions on Orabewa Ridge, the two regiments had arrived in Port Moresby. However, Harding's four battalions of Division Artillery-48 field guns including the superb 105 mm howitzers that are good in breaching bunkers, were left behind in Australia due to a lack of sea and air transport. The mission assigned to these two regiments was to take Puna, an enormous complex of Japanese defended sites, but Eichelberger doubted the combat prowess of the untested 32nd. The men of the 32nd Division departed from Port Moresby in a variety of wooden schooners and coastal craft due to the vast coastline of northern Papua near Buna. These insufficient ships could not transport heavy equipment, artillery, or tanks and were open to air bombardment by the Japanese. It was understandable why the U.S. officers in the Navy did not want to take a chance with their bigger vessels in unknown waters against an adversary that had control over the airfields. In addition, in the waters around Guadalcanal, the Allied warships were engaged in combat with Japanese surface ships. After deciding to go on the defensive at Buna, the Japanese infantrymen and SNLF soldiers looked for hiding places such as trenches, rifle pits, pillboxes, coconut tree tops, camouflage entrenchments, and even entangled tree roots. The American and Australian assault soldiers would be subjected to withering fire and never see the defenders if the Japanese hiding tactics were effective. The thick of the jungle canopy hampered airstrikes. Thus, the Allied attackers had to learn, frequently on the fly, to identify and probe possible camouflage defense positions. The Allies would use tanks, artillery, flamethrowers, and bazookas to destroy them once they were located. Large-scale, direct infantry assaults were replaced by smaller infantry units that advanced while receiving covering fire from a machine gun or rifle unit that cooperated. In this fashion, forces would press forward against the opposing positions in intervals of advance and covering fire. The quality of the defenses built by the Japanese engineers along the 11-mile stretch of northern Papuan coastline, which stretched from Ghana in the west to Cape and Diadere to the east of Buna Mission and Doropa Point, was highlighted in an Australian after-action report. Numerous coconut wood bunkers were built. Some had iron plates for reinforcement, while others had iron rails and sand-filled oil drums. Bunkers were constructed above ground and covered with dirt, tree fronds, and other vegetation to make them virtually invisible in locations too moist for trenches and dugouts. A fierce interlocking field of fire was created by the bunkers, which could house three to five machine guns against any advancing Allied forces. Infantry in open rifle pits to the front, sides, and back of the constructed entrenchments guarded the bunkers, while some men would wait in the carefully camouflaged forest. Others would hide out in foxholes, beneath trees, or even inside hollowed-out logs. Along the Buna front, snipers in the thick coconut trees and in positions in disguised terrain posed a serious threat to both the Australian and American zones. Another Japanese defensive line was constructed across the road that led from Saputa, which is slightly over seven miles inland, to Sanananda Point on the sea in order to thwart the advance of the 7th Australian Division. The Australians were to the west of the Darul River, where they had to march over forest routes in order to attack Kona and Sanananda Point. The Darul River functioned as an inter-allied border, 
the Duro River flows roughly 50 feet before drying up in the wetlands southeast of Buna Village. The river finally empties into the ocean between Buna and San Ananda Point at multiple mouths. There were two other canals that were significant to the fighting. The first was Entrance Creek, which between Buna Village and Buna Mission opened into a tiny lagoon. The other, Samini Creek, parallels the old strip's northern edge to the sea between Doropa and strip points before running north to the location where Buna's old and new strips meet. The main marsh on the Buna front is located between Entrance Creek to the west and Simony Creek to the east. It extends interior to the area around the villages of Simemi and Ango, which were in the middle of the 32nd Division's area of operations against the Buna with trees up to 100 feet tall that are densely spaced. This marsh is completely impenetrable. The floor of the marsh is always wet due to the intertwined roots and underbrush. There were two sizable plantations of coconuts. The first, government plantation, was located between Buna Mission and the mouth of Samani Creek. It measured roughly 300 yards in width. Larger in size, Doropa Plantation stretched southward from Cape Indiadere in the east, heading westward towards Strip Point. The Old Strip, the objective of the Allied offensive, was located on a sizable expanse of kunai grass to the southwest of Doropa Plantation. If the Allies took control of the airfield, the Japanese would not be able to retake Port Morrisby by land and use it as a base for the 5th Air Force of the United States. Located in a grassy area east of Semini Creek, the Japanese constructed a dummy field known as New Strip, which ran east-west. Following the Australians' peaceful reoccupation of Kokoda Village on November 2, MacArthur had to defend both his recently gained airstrip at Kokoda and another at Dobadura, which is located around three miles south of Ango, as the Kokoda Trail crisis subsided. MacArthur was bent on a campaign of destruction against the Japanese on Papua's northern coast, rather than the less expensive tactic of starving them into capitulation, because Japanese possession of Buna may ultimately threaten both airfields. On the other hand, the Japanese demanded that Buna be kept under lockdown and that the Dobadura airstrip, which was located 10 miles south of Buna, be demolished. Losing Dobadura would make it more difficult for the Allies to reinforce Papua and reduce their ability to launch airstrikes. Tokyo reasoned that the loss of Buna would put Japanese interests in Rabaul and future operations in New Guinea and Jeopardy. The Japanese were so determined to fight to the death to protect the Buna front. MacArthur's plan called for the Australian 7th Division to launch a general advance on November 16, 1942 pushing the Japanese back along the Kokoda Trail, while the U.S. 32nd Division would march covertly and widely eastward, then launch an attack westward against the Buna front along Papua's northern coast. The Daru River was to be the boundary separating the Australian and American forces. Still, the Japanese troops stationed there were well sheltered from any interior onslaught. The Allied attackers were directed along a few trails by deep forest and swamps, where a reinforced pillbox with a Japanese machine gun could hold off a battalion. The Australians would lose a great deal of blood trying to take Buna from the Japanese, as the Americans advanced along the coast of northern New Guinea. The 127th Regiment stayed in Port Moresby, while the 126th, and 128th regiments of the 32nd continued to advance into position for the remainder of October and the first part of November 1942. As the left flank of the Army, 2nd Battalion, 126th Regiment marched overland to Buna along the rough Kappa Kappa Trail, which climbs over 8,000 feet across the Owen Stanley Range. This unit suffered casualties from disease and non-combat-related causes. On November 20, the unit arrived in Saputa after five exhausting weeks of fighting. The weary Americans called this trail Green Hell. Major Gen. George C. Kenney's 5th Air Force transport planes 
airlifted the three battalions of the 128th Regiment to an improved airstrip at Wanijala Mission on Collinwood Bay, about 65 miles from Buna, to maximize time and effort and avoid an exhausting march through the Papuman jungle. The 128th was then transported by motor barges to Pongani, which is located slightly over 20 miles from Buna, along the Papuan coast. On November 9 to 11, the last two battalions of the 126th Regiment were airlifted to this new location after the forces built a landing strip there. C 47s carried a total of about 15,000 infantrymen and support forces to the Buna region. Kenny made the 5th Air Force a multipurpose force capable of providing airborne artillery to units lacking ground artillery, as well as troop transport and logistics. His B-25 Mitchell and A-20 Havoc medium bombers improved upon previous advances, allowing for increased daytime interdiction of Japanese coastal shipping and reinforcements to their garrisons in New Guinea. These were revolutionary tactics in 1942, when Papuan laborers and army engineers started constructing airfields in northern Papua, most notably at Dobadura, east of the Garua River and south of Buna, to give Kenny's planes a base closer to the combat zone so they could carry out their various missions. Lieutenant Jin Hatazo Adaki assumed command of the IJA-18 Army, which had just been created in mid-November 1942, with headquarters located in Rabaul and operations focused in New Guinea. Lieutenant Gen Hitoshi Imamura, the commander of the 8th Area Army, was to oversee Adaki. Prime Minister Hideki Tojo gave Imamura specific orders to retake Guadalcanal and to hold and solidify at Buna. There would be plans for another land invasion of Port Moresby in the future. Adachi's 18th Army and Hayakutek's 17th Army, which was dedicated only to the Guadalcanal operation, made up Imamura's area army. Adachi gathered between 2,000 and 2,500 troops for the defense of the Buna area. Despite heavy Allied bomber interdiction of Japanese reinforcements and mountain artillery from Raval, of which roughly 1,800 had not taken part in the overland assault on Port Moresby. IJ formations, SNLF units, engineers, gunners, and service personnel made up Buna's Japanese defenders. While some had just landed, roughly 100 infantrymen from the 144th Regiment had survived the retreat at the Kokoda Trail where General Hori lost his life while attempting to flee to Ley by drowning in the swiftly flowing Kumusi River. By November 18, the 1st Battalion of the American 128th Regiment was located on the northern coast's route between Harico and the Daropa Plantation. The 1st Battalion of the 126th Regiment was using the same primitive trail, which led up from Oro Bay. This regiment's remaining members were positioned close to Vananda, while parts of the 128th 2nd Battalion helped construct the airfield at Dobadura on the grassy open plain. The 3rd Battalion of the 128th Regiment was located close to Saimemi. Since Japanese air interdiction, like that of the Allies, had stifled coastal supply by motor barges and schooners. Food and ammunition would need to be flown to this new sector. At Ango, the remaining elements of the 2nd Battalion formed a division reserve. Buna, lacking a harbor and shielded from the inland side by marshes and creeks, could only be reached by four jumbled pathways, each about 12 feet wide, but always vulnerable to being swept away by tropical downpours. In order to facilitate the transportation of supplies and wounded in jeeps, the American engineers of the 114th Regiment were continuously constructing corduroy roads with coconut log surfaces. The American approach to Buna was limited to two routes. One followed the Ango track on the west side of the swamp, toward Buna Mission and Buna Village, and the other, between Simami Creek and the east coast. Marching from one flank to the other took two days due to the absence of lateral communication on the two routes. 
More crucially, the Americans were ill-prepared for the enemy resistance and the locations of defensive works they would shortly encounter. The Buna front of Adaki was less than a mile from the ocean and slightly over three miles long. It began the west at the Guru River close to Buna village and extended to Cape and Diadare in the east. From Buna Mission to the bridge at Simami Creek, the Japanese possessed a motor road that allowed for reinforcement and lateral communication. The line of Japanese pillboxes and rifle pits moved eastward across a grassy area called Government Gardens and then ran toward the coast through Government Plantation, ending at Veropa Point. Specifically, the entrenched defensive works at Buna Mission ran slightly southwest to Entrance Creek and then turned north to enclose an area known as the Triangle. Veteran soldiers from China and Malaya Captain Yoshitatsu Yasuda and his Yokosuka 5th SNLF and the 5th Sasebo SNLF were in charge of defending Buna Village and Buna Mission, which was located in the western sector. Yasuda had erected thick entanglements of barbed wire along this stretch in order to impede an approach from the south. The SNLF forces were stationed in the coconut grove and gardens behind the wetlands as well as in a network of bunkers arranged in a honeycomb pattern on the main approach. Along with portions of Hori's retreating South Seas Force, other combat troops at Buna were the Sukioka unit survivors from their three-month nightmare on Goodna Island. When their landing barges for the Milne Bay amphibious attack were intercepted by Allied air patrols, more fortified positions were located along the western end of the Old Strip, which had been constructed by Australian soldiers before to the Japanese invasion in July 1942, around 500 yards southeast of Daropa Point. When Japanese naval aircraft used it in August, it was heavily attacked, rendered useless, and several disabled Zero fighters and transports were left stranded on the runway. Between the old and new airstrips, the enemy positions proceeded eastward, they crossed Sememi Creek on a wooden causeway that was more than 40 yards long, skirted the northern side of the new strip, passed through Duropa Plantation, and edged up against the ocean half a mile south of Cape and Diadare. Colonel Shijimi Yamamoto's 3rd Battalion, 229th Infantry Regiment, which had taken Gona until mid-November, and had already taken Hong Kong and Canton, guarded this eastern Japanese flank. Among the many units were the 73rd Independent Unit's Heavy Anti-Aircraft Battery, the 3rd Battalion's Mountain Artillery Battery, the 55th Field Artillery Unit, and 700 replacements for the 144th Infantry Regiment. The majority of the Japanese forces the American troops would encounter during the first two weeks of the Allied assault on Buna would be young, healthy, and well-prepared. American infantry on the advance first had to understand where the enemy's camouflaged bunkers were, as advanced units were frequently destroyed by Japanese machine gun fire. After that, they had to conduct expensive frontal or flank attacks, the latter requiring them to crawl through marshy terrain. Because flashless gunpowder was employed by Arisaka rifles and Japanese machine guns, the source of the shooting, was impossible to locate. Occasionally, the well-hidden Japanese fortifications would enable approaching American infantrymen to pass through before the defenders opened fire from all sides, severely wounding the patrol's rear echelon. The 128th Regiment's 1st and 3rd Battalions began the Buna operation on November 19, 1942, by moving toward the Japanese fortifications that stretched from Semini Creek down the New Strip to the seashore. Japanese machine gun and rifle fire went unnoticed as the 1st Battalion advanced into the Daropa Plantation along the coastal route, while the 3rd Battalion approached the dummy airport at New Strip to the southwest. The 2 Battalion March of the 128th Regiment was unexpectedly halted as the Japanese, who had lateral lines of communication, hastily fortified their positions. General Harding received a frustrated MacArthur's order two days later to storm Buna's defensive defenses, stating, 
all columns will be driven through to objectives regardless of losses take Booma now if you can macarthur since there was no american artillery there harding ordered a frontal assault that day along the japanese easternmost lines following a preliminary bombing raid and mortar strike once more the japanese invasion was thwarted by snipers well-aimed machine guns and mortar fire additionally following the air raids the japanese would sneak back to their pillboxes to be ready at their machine guns if the americans advanced they would escape to reinforce bunkers during the aircraft bombardment additionally on november twenty one the enemy stopped the second battalion one hundred and twenty eighth regiment at the triangle south of government gardens in the western sector the regiment had just completed the arduous kappa kappa trail march the terrain consisted mainly of knee-deep swamp water that confused the gs especially in the dark destroyed radios saturated mortar ammunition and clawed machine guns and rifles with muck west of the triangle entrance creek was unaffordable for a flanking move unless the japanese had strategically placed barbed wire and machine guns there to keep the americans at bay on twenty two november the australians released second battalion one hundred and twenty sixth regiment which had been assisting the australian seventh division to assist the second battalion one hundred and twenty eighth regiment which was having difficulties at entrance creek and the triangle of the three thousand five hundred combat personnel that remained general harding organized two sizable task forces the second battalions of the one hundred and twenty sixth and one hundred and twenty eighth regiments would operate to the west of the sizable swamp region and they were given the designation urbana force colonel john mott commanded the smaller of the two troops and his mission was to attack Buna village and then advance upon Buna mission. The bigger force, known as Warren, force was commanded by Brig, Jen Hamford McNider, and consisted of the 1st Battalion, 126th Regiment, the 1st and 3rd Battalions of the 128th Infantry Regiment, and some Australian components. It was located east of the marsh, Warren force was directed to assault the defenses extending from Garopa Point to Cape Endadier in the eastern sector. This was the final movement of Allied troops before reinforcements reached the Buna front. Urbana force advanced toward the Triangle region on November 24, and following a day of crawling through the foul-smelling swamp, arrived at a location northwest of Entrance Creek, next to the trail leading to Buna Village the triangle constituted a deep enemy salient with interlocking machine guns and mortars that was inaccessible from the east due to the presence of both open kunai grass regions and swamps that hindered advances therefore urbana forces next course of action would need to go toward buna village northwest of the triangle the warren force area was where the combat moved on november twenty sixth after being bombarded from the air and by artillery which included one american one hundred and five millimeters howitzer battery six australian twenty five pounders and a mountain howitzer that had been recently airlifted to the front elements of the third battalion one hundred and twenty eighth regiment and the first battalion one hundred and twenty sixth regiment attacked japanese positions at Doropa plantation but allied fighters had trouble identifying targets and resupplying ammo the infantry attack was stalled under heavy enemy machine gun fire because the japanese reinforced bunkers had not been destroyed by the initial aerial and cannon bombardment no additional attempts to weaken the defensive defenses were made for seventy-two hours the strafing by japanese fighters from lay greatly impeded the war and force progress on november thirty an attempt at a fresh offensive on the urbana force front west of entrance creek was thwarted while an attempt at a two battalion assault in the daropa plantation to the east failed in the absence of the intended australian brand gun carriages after inflicting roughly five hundred american losses the japanese defensive line along the buna front was therefore undented and as strong as it had been over two weeks previously malaria 
Diarrhea and scrub typhus were among the battle and non-combat casualties that caused the 32nd Battalions to be reduced to half strength. After visiting Harding, Lieutenant Gen. Richard K. Sutherland, MacArthur's Chief of Staff, suggested that a change in leadership be made. MacArthur then gave Eichelberger the order to depart for Buna on December 1 in order to assume command of the Allied forces east of the Garou River and remove all officers who won't fight, relieve regimental and battalion commanders, put corporals in charge of companies, either take Buna or don't come back alive is what I want. Even while they had maintained their positions, the Japanese were also experiencing a decline in morale and growing attrition. The December 1 entries in enemy journals discovered at Buna stated things like, Now we are waiting only for death. My body will be buried in New Guinea and become fertilizer for the soil of Buna, and they have been waiting for reinforcements for the past four days. Kenny's B-17s were delivering 105mm howitzers to the Buna front, easing logistical challenges for the Allies. On December 5 and December 18, respectively, Australian manned Bren carriers and M3 Stewart light tanks arrived at Eichelberger and went to work. Supplies were being shipped out by air and sea in greater quantities. Eichelberger appointed new local commanders and slightly reorganized his army. Harding was succeeded by Major Gen Albert Waldron, the artillery chief for the 32nd Division. Colonel John Gross was to head Urbana Force and Brig. Gen. Clarence Martin headed Warren Force. The 32nd and Eichelberger's I Corps headquarters were merged to form Buna Force headquarters, which is located at Simony Village. Along with picking up battle experience, enlisted soldiers and junior officers were also learning basic jungle skills. On December 5, 1942, a three-battalion offensive was launched through the Daropa Plantation with the assistance of Bren gun transporters. However, they were soon rendered inoperable by Japanese snipers concealed in trees, as well as by soldiers armed with explosives and tree stumps. Other firms targeted the Simony Creek Bridge and the western boundary of the new strip. The advances were assessed in yards because the Japanese positions could not be reduced. From December 6 to 14, the Warren Force would launch several attacks on the enemy, but they would be unable to breach the Japanese defenses in spite of MacArthur's orders. On December 5, platoon-sized members of Company G, 126th Regiment, successfully drove east of the Garou River to the sea, separating Buna Village from Japanese reinforcements Station at Government, Station and Buna Mission on the Urbana Force Front. E Company of the 126th moved in to assist in fending off Japanese counterattacks along the shore. Finally, the enemy defensive line in the western sector had been broken, albeit at great cost, with Waldron, the 32nd's new commander, and an aide to Eichelberger suffering injuries at the front. Eichelberger sent in reinforcements in the form of the 3rd Battalion, 127th Regiment, led by Lieutenant Colonel Edwin Swedberg, who was airlifted to the Dalbadura and Papandetta airfields on December 9 in order to prevent the breakthrough near Buna Village from stalling. On December 11, they relieved the 2nd Battalion, 126th Regiment. Three days later, two companies of 3rd Battalion 127th Regiment, after patrolling and getting to know the enemy's fortifications, took Luna Village after a strong mortar barrage. As there was no warning to allow them to temporarily move to reinforce shelters, some of the few Japanese captives taken said that American mortar bombardment was particularly efficient at wearing them down in their pillboxes and rifle pits. In order to break the impasse on the war in front at Buna, Eichelberger made the decision to hold off until mid-December for the arrival of light tanks and new Australian troops that General Blamey had ordered to be moved up from Milne Bay. The remaining battalions of the 18th Infantry Brigade under Brigadier George F. Wooten arrived with seven light M3 tanks from X Squadron, Australian 26th Armored Regiment, 
This would significantly increase the Allied firepower at Buna, where their only weapons were two American 105mm howitzers with little ammo and an Australian short 25-pounder. The three American battalions on the Warren Front advanced against the Japanese throughout the entire line from December 15 to 18. On December 18, as they swung west down the north coast, Portions of the Australian 2-9th Infantry Battalion were stopped by a fresh line of enemy bunkers after passing through the American lines with the accompanying tanks and reaching Cape and Diadere. Although an Allied coastal position was established immediately south of Cape and Diadere, an Australian push was followed by the 3rd Battalion, 128th Regiment, which destroyed two and three tanks and set a third on fire. Furthermore, American and Australian forces, notably 1st Battalion, 128th Regiment, succeeded in driving the Japanese out of their defenses at the eastern spur of the New Strip, compelling them to withdraw to bunkers they had erected close to the Simony Creek Bridge. The reinforced Japanese bunkers at the Daropa Plantation and along the northern side of the New Strip had been reduced but almost one-third of the Australians were lost. The Australian 2 9th Battalion and parts of the 3rd Battalion, 128th Regiment advanced through the remaining Daropa Plantation on a 1,000-yard front on December 19-20. to 20. Eventually reaching the bridge, the 1st Battalions of the 126th and 128th Regiments destroyed every Japanese bunker on the east side of Simony Creek, Nevertheless, the enemy had blown a 12-foot gap in this causeway that would need to be repaired or a flanking operation would have to be executed. On December 21-23, to the Australian 2 tenths Battalion crossed the creek north of the bridge and threatened the Japanese positions thereafter failing to close the gap. By lunchtime on December 23, the 1st Battalion, 126th Regiment, had crossed the bridge and reached the southern end of the old strip. Now, the Australian and American battalions would try to advance simultaneously along the old strip's northern and southern flanks. Despite fierce fire from enemy bunkers on the northern and center parts of the old strip, Allied forces carefully pushed 500 yards. On December 23, after midnight, the 114th engineers fixed the bridge's breach so the Australian M3 light tanks could cross Samoni Creek. On December 24, an Allied tank attack was launched across the bridge to reach the northeastern flank of the Old Strip. However, the Japanese or the ground riddled with shell holes rendered all of the tanks immobile. The Americans had taken control of an area known as Coconut Grove on December 16 but they had not yet taken control of the triangle. After crossing Entrance Creek on a footbridge built by the United States to cross it to the north above Coconut Grove, the 127th Regiment was able to establish a bridgehead on the east bank on December 24. Engineers in the Army Instead of attacking the enemy head-on, the Triangle region's resistance would now be just contained. The American infantry began a drive toward the northern shore on Christmas Eve in order to get between Buna Mission and Europa Point, which they would reach on December 29. The Christmas Day attacks by the Allies were not very successful since the Japanese had a strong pocket of bunkers that prevented the Australian and American battalions from advancing. With the help of an Australian 25-pounder artillery piece at the Simony Creek Bridge, which fired armor-piercing shells at the persistent Japanese bunkers impeding the progress down the old strip, sections of the 1st Battalion, 126th Regiment, was able to move gradually on December 26 and 27. On December 27, by dusk, the western edge of the old strip was reached, allowing for a northward advance to government plantation, which, in terms of geography, started in the east at the mouth of the Simony Creek and stretched northwest to Buna Mission. American patrols discovered that the Japanese had left the Triangle area early on December 28. The Americans also found out why the enemy was putting up such a strong fight in the Triangle. 
It had more than 18 reinforced bunkers that supported one another and were connected by communication trenches. The Allied infantry waited to await reinforcements as four new M3 light tanks led a sluggish push on government plantation the following day. On December 31, the two twelfths of the 18th Infantry Brigade, an Australian relief battalion, arrived with additional tanks. On January 1, 1943, near Daropa Point, Lieutenant Colonel Arthur Arnold, the commander of two twelfths battalion, launched an offensive that succeeded in penetrating to the northern coast. While some two twelfths battalion soldiers proceeded west to contact Urbana Force, elements of this force moved against the major enemy defenses at government plantation to the southeast. To help eliminate the remaining Japanese pockets of resistance, the 3rd Battalion, 128th Regiment pushed northwestward between the Old Strip and the shore on January 2. According to reports, Captain Yasuda and Colonel Yamamoto perished while facing the incoming Australian tanks at their command bunker. Since 3rd Battalion, 127th Regiment, had taken Buna Village two weeks earlier, progress on the Urbana front had been slow, mainly due to the lack of Australian tank backup, which the Warren Force had profited from. On January 2, 1943, after three months of frontal assaults, the Japanese base at Buna was in the hands of the Allies because the Papuan terrain prohibited envelopments with huge forces. Out of the initial 2,000 Japanese defenders, 1,450 were confirmed captured or lost at Buna alone, and many more perished in the bush or at sea. The Urbana and Warren forces suffered 620 casualties at Buna on the Allied side, comprising 267 Australians and 353 Americans. In addition, 132 people went missing and 2,065 were injured. Tens of thousands of people died from malaria mostly as a result of quinine shortages. Unit integrity was seriously damaged at Buna, and the 32nd Infantry Division would need to spend up to a year refurbishing in Australia in order to be ready for the upcoming round of fighting. In order to retrain and equip the two American divisions for upcoming operations in New Guinea, Eichelberger returned to Australia in his capacity as commander of I Corps. The 1942-1943 Papuan campaign taught the U.S. Army's Southwest Pacific leaders a great deal, but at a great cost. Evidently, the U.S. additional training was needed for Army forces. The Australians, on the other hand, had served in the Middle East before. Following the triumph in Papua in January 1943, MacArthur proclaimed the end of the Bunas. The official history of Australia states that the battle was so horrific that most of the war's hardened soldiers would remember it uncomfortably as their most grueling experience, a ghastly nightmare. This was due to the Japanese's fixity on ending their lives, the dank and silent bush, the heavy loss of life, and the primordial swamps.